identity. Identity is the foundation of everything else. It is the heart of everything. Because if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what to do, right? Again, if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what to do. I said somebody has to have already come up with that saying, and so I Googled it, and I couldn't find it. Maybe somebody famous said that, but it really does seem to sum up something about life. And I think one of the greatest illustrations about this is from the Walt Disney animated film, The Lion King. So if Dr. Hansen can talk about The Little House on the Prairie, I can talk about The Lion King. Now, The Lion King came out 30 years ago before any of you were born. And I don't know if anybody watches that today. Has anybody actually seen The Lion King? That Oh, a lot of people see it. Well, I'll give you a little, a little synopsis here. The Lion King is a, is a story about a lion named Simba. And it starts off when he's a boy, and he is the son of the king of the lions. And his uncle is jealous of Simba and his dad and hatches this plot with a group of hyenas to kill Simba and his father and take over the kingdom. And his plot is actually successful, except for one thing, which is Simba manages to escape. And he runs away and he ends up in this oasis and far away from where the lions were living. And he meets some new friends and they sort of take him in. And they've got, uh, they've got a saying, uh, which I'm, is the, the word I'm going to get wrong is something like hakuna matata, which means no worries. And that becomes Simba's uh, motto of life. He's just living this carefree life in this oasis. He's eating, he's playing, he's having a good time. He doesn't have any responsibilities. He's a lion. Nobody can do anything to him. And so he spends years like this and grows up living this life uh, over there. And one day, his father's old advisor named Rafiki tracks him down and starts giving him a hard time. And Rafiki says to him, Simba, you know what your problem is? You don't even know who you are. And then he goes on to say, actually, did you know I know your father? He's still around. He's still here. I can show them to you. And of course, Simba's like, what? My dad's still alive? So he runs after Rafiki, who takes him to this river. And he says, look into the river. And so Simba looks down into the river, and he just sees his own reflection. He's like, I got some bad news for you, Rafiki. That's just my reflection in the water. And he says look again. And he looks into the water and the reflection dissolves. And Simba has this sort of mystical encounter with, I guess, the ghost of his father. And after this encounter is over, Simba realizes something for the very first time in his life. He's like, wait a minute. I am the Lion King. I am the king of the lions now. And once he knew who he was, he knew he couldn't stay living the life that he was living. He had to go back and set things right and restore flourishing and peace to the land. Once he knew who he was, then he knew what to do. And that is so important for us to know who we are. So I'll share a little bit about my identity uh, today and how that shapes me. The first is, I'm a Christian. And there's a lot that goes into what it means to be a Christian, but uh, I will just share a couple parts uh, of that. In the first chapter of uh, Paul's book of Ephesians, one of the things he writes is, God predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. So Christians believe that we have been adopted as sons of God. So in essence, like Simba, we are part of the royal family of heaven. But do we live like that? Do we truly believe it? Because if I believed that I've been adopted as a son of God, then that's a very noble and high calling. That's a high standard to live up to. It elevates our sights in terms of what we want to do and how we want to live our life. It also says in Ephesians, that in him we have also obtained an inheritance. So another part of the Christian teaching is that we have an inheritance that can never be taken away from us, that is secure, right? We've got the trust fund 
that can never be taken away. Now, if we believed that, right, if we truly believed that, then we can make full contact with life, right? I can put myself out there. I can take risks. I can lean into the discomfort because I have something that's secure and I can't lose. And uh, so much of the letters of the New Testament really is just Paul reminding these Christians of who they are. Another one of his lines, do you not know that you will judge angels? Think about that. I'm also an American. So this is my country, right? These are my people. I am not a citizen of anywhere. I'm not a citizen of nowhere. I'm a citizen of this place. And that means I have a responsibility to uphold and a legacy to extend for America, for our country and our people. I'm also a husband to my wife, Katie, and a father to my son, Alex. So I have to think about them. I can't just think about myself. So who we believe deep down that we are determines how we live. It determines what we do. So who are you? What is your identity? What are the things that you believe about yourself and who you are? You know, that, that's going to inform and shape so much of your life. And, you know, I'd say all of us have multiple identities. There's not just one answer to that question. And, in fact, I would argue that it's actually not healthy to try to reduce just to one identity. So if, if I say I'm just a father and that's all that I am, then if, you know, God forbid my son were to die, which sometimes things like that happen, they do then I not only lose my son, I lose my identity. We all have multiple uh, identities. Identity is dangerous, right? Once Simba knew who he was, he was now a threat to the people who had usurped, uh, you know, his rightful throne and who were uh, ruling as tyrants uh, over the land. And so the people who run our society, I think in many ways, want to sever you from any sense of identity that might threaten their control. So, for example, think about the way that they talk about America, uh, for example. If you listen to the way that sort of kind of our elite culture talks about America, you would think it is nothing but a collection of historic injustices. It's the 1619 Project view of America. Well, why would, they, why would they do this? Well, there's a lot of reasons to do this, but one is to make you ashamed of America, to make it impossible for you to identify with America in anything other than a sort of negative context. Because if you identify as an American who stands in a great and noble, if certainly imperfect, tradition, then you, know, you are a potential threat or obstacle to the ways that they might want to transform the country into something else. They also do not want you to have a positive identity as a man. You typically don't see the media say a lot of good things about men. You're much more likely to hear about toxic masculinity and how traditional masculinity is bad. There's so many articles um, about this. Again, they don't want you to have that identity as a man. You know what a lot of people today de facto seem to want? They want you living like Simba. You know, they want you pulling out your phone, placing some bets on the big game, surfing the porn, smoking the pot, living the consumerist lifestyle, just hanging out in the big city, living the bro life, but just consumption, right? all about consumption, all about fun in the now. And like Simba, well, he was no threat to the tyrants. He was no threat to the bad guys, to the way the world's being run when he was living that life. And if you're living that life, you know, then... Neither of you. You cannot let other people rob you of your identity. Uh, because identity is powerful. Identity is foundational. Who are you is the most fundamental question. <laughs>